All right, welcome. Uh, as Dong mentioned, uh, I'm Evan. Uh, I'm a core uh, engineer on the uh, engine team. And today we're going to talk about uh, ContainerD events. So first we're going to go over what uh, ContainerD is, a very high level overview. Um, then we're going to look at ContainerD events, kind of the, the life cycle of a container, and uh, has you create and start and delete these and then the events that go along with it. And then we're going to show some integration examples um, using use cases, uh, hopefully in what are real world scenarios. So first off, what is ContainerD? Um, ContainerD, it's a container runtime uh, that emphasizes simplicity, robustness, and portability. And if you watched the keynote this morning, um, Solomon talked about plumbing level tools. Um, that's what ContainerD is. So it sits above the operating system um, and provides a layer of abstraction for, for downstream tooling. So what can it do? Um, ContainerD is uh, a container executor and supervisor. And what that means is ContainerD will handle um, interfacing with the operating system to set up the namespace as well as root file systems um, and so on and so forth for the container and then execute um, as well as supervising that and managing I.O. It also contains uh, the capabilities for image distribution. And this means that it can fetch uh, remote images that can then be used as uh, root file systems. And there's a, um, a, a note to mention here is it's not confined to um, what we know today most of uh, what we use in containers, which is like Docker images. These can be um, any OCI image from, from uh, a remote location. We'll see that more in, in the demos. ContainerD also um, contains a built-in metrics endpoint, uh, which provides very um, in-depth uh, metrics for not just ContainerD, but also at the container level. And since it's a plumbing level tool, it contains a first class plumbing level API. So that's ContainerD, what, what it can do, what can it not do? So in the ContainerD project, um, there's a, a clearly defined scope. Um, probably one of the best projects we have uh, sponsored by Docker and in what we define, what we plan for it to do as well as what we plan for it, that it won't do. What it will not do is build. So there's no building. It will not create images. Um, it won't create root file systems. This uh, containerd expects that you, you bring those um, and, or either have them available or you fetch them. It also does not handle uh, logging. So uh, with the exception of the containerd binary itself, uh, the daemon where it's actually running and, and sending its logging, it will not handle container level um, logging. So that is up to the downstream project. There's also no volume API. So in Docker where you have volumes, uh, a very rich volumes API where you can create volumes, you can manage them, you can share them between containers. Uh, ContainerD does not uh, do that. It doesn't enforce any type of volume management. Um, so once again, it's a plumbing level. Um, you're expected, uh, or, or the, the downstream project is expected to, to manage that. And finally, there's no networking. Um, so ContainerD, will give you the primitives uh, with, uh, via the OCI spec to set up any namespaces uh, that you need. So you can get, for example, a network namespace, but it will not set up VETH pairs or bridging or anything like that. So with the plumbing level uh, tooling, where exactly does that fit in? So if we, if we take a look, ContainerD sits above the operating system, as mentioned, and, and provides an, an abstraction uh, and a set of APIs that then a downstream can uh, use that to, to execute containers. And an example of this is uh, such as Docker. We've used this for, for a, a very long time. Um, that is what we use to abstract um, so we don't have to continuously worry about managing containers uh, in the Docker daemon. But we also do this so that the ecosystem can use it, such as Microsoft ACS or Kubernetes. So they can use this, we can create a project where the community can um, contribute so that we have a common layer that we're executing containers through. So with it being at the plumbing level, uh, what you expect is a very rich um, API. And ContainerD has a very rich, very well-defined, very well-designed set of gRPC APIs that allow you to control um, various uh, parts of uh, what you need for container execution. Now, the, um, I, I want to emphasize this uh, a lot. The ContainerD team um, is very, very, uh, very good. Some spectacular engineers, and these uh, APIs aren't 
Um, if, if you've used the Docker API a little bit, sometimes there gets to where things are kind of mixed together. These are very well isolated and defined. So we have um, a content API, which is responsible for managing the content addressable storage system, such as committing objects, getting info, retrieving, and so on and so forth. There's the images uh, gRPC API, which is responsible for uh, basically like metadata. So it maps um, names to the container roots. Then there's the rootfs gRPC API, which is responsible for unpacking and setting up and preparing the root file system for the container to be uh, to use uh, for execution. Then the execution API, which is everything that you would expect around managing containers, such as creating, starting, stopping, info, and so on and so forth. And finally, the shim API, which is launched with uh, shim is launched with every container, um, and that provides the uh, management around I/O. So today. We're going to get into focus on a specific uh, API and, and, in particular, a specific part of the API. So, if we take a look just to see kind of what this is, um, it's this is the execution service, uh, the execution API, which contains a container service, and this has all of the the methods that you would expect, such as creating, starting, deleting, listing info, etc. And you can see it's it's pretty contained, it's pretty well defined. This is actually, I believe this is the most, uh, well maybe the shim is a little bit more, but this is the most in depth. Most of them are very clean and very simple. It provides uh, just some very good uh, interoperability to, to work with. So with that API, such as creating and uh, starting and stopping, et cetera, we can look at what the container lifecycle is. Now in container D, this is actually surprisingly very simple. Um, it's, you have a create, where you would create a container object using an OCI spec, um, you then start it, right? It seems pretty simple. Uh, once you're uh, finished with the container, you're ready to remove it, then you delete it. Now, we're gonna go into the first demo just to, to let you know this is gonna be, a, I'm a very demo heavy uh, speaker, so hopefully everything goes well. So let's take a look. So hopefully everyone can see it, I think so. Um, this is going to be a very, very simple example. And for people that have used containers or specifically Docker before, this is going to seem very, very basic, and, and it is. However, it's going to demonstrate um, just where we're going to start using these, uh, this lifecycle. So before I get into this too much, um, the Container D project has several tools um, that come with it. Now, these tools are not stable. They're not meant to be used in production. Um, they're meant for debug purposes only. So it is intended that the downstream project will have its, uh, bring its own CLI, such as the Docker CLI, um, or its own user experience around it. However, for this demo um, and this talk, so I don't bore you guys to death uh, with looking at setup and specs, we're gonna use it. So the first tool that we're gonna use is the CTR, and this is CTR run. Um, run is very um, similar to where you would do a Docker run. We're gonna add a dash T, which is to say allocate a, a TTY, give it an ID, and then the image. Now you'll notice, uh, first off, if you're familiar with Docker, we don't just have uh, Redis, we actually have the full path. And this will uh, allow us to retrieve it from, from any uh, remote and pull it down and run it. I already have it local, so if I, if I run this, I could then look using CTR list, and I have a container running, right? So, woohoo, big deal, right? <laughs> Let's take a look at what that, what that really did. So, container D also has a very, uh, a very rock solid event subsystem. And what this will do is anytime uh, you, you create or start or delete um, a container, it triggers an event. Now, that very simple example what we did um, also fired these events. So when we first, when we did the run, it actually did to, um, to start, it created it first, so then it triggered the create event, then it did a start, which triggers a start event, and if I go back and remove it, it, it uh, triggers the exit. Now this is, it's very simple, it's a very simple life cycle, but it allows us to have the, the groundwork so that we can start tying into these, and really, it's, it's, it seems very simple, but it gives us quite a few places to where we can do just about anything we really want to. So let's, let's take a look. So if we want to we want to hook in this, there's going to be some code too. Um, uh, error checking and so forth has been removed. All the source code will be at the end, so don't worry too much. Um, you can look through this. Uh, there'll be links at the end. But the first thing we want to do when we work with this uh, execution uh, or the container service API is first we want to instantiate the, a new container service. Then if we follow along second line. We're going to get a handle to the events uh, system, and then we simply loop and we receive. And anytime we receive an event, we're going to handle it. Right? 
pretty straightforward, pretty simple. So let's take a look at this actually in, in code. So uh, for this example, hopefully everybody can see this. In this example, I have uh, refactored out the setup of, of just the actually setting up the, the handlers and, and looping through into a separate library that'll be there. But uh, just for readability, uh, that's, that's the way it is. So all we're gonna look at here is an actual handler. So when we handle this event, we're gonna use uh, the LogRS logging library. And we're gonna just log these out to the terminal. So here we're gonna grab the event type, which tells what type of event that was. That's the create, the start, or the exit. And we're gonna tell the ID, which is the ID coming from the container. The PID, uh, PID from the container, exit status of that as well as the timestamp. So let me clear this real quick. So if we run this, um, once again, this is all, uh, put all the source code available uh, at the end, uh, send a link. But we're gonna, so we're gonna run this, and what it's doing is it's actually attaching, getting a handle to that event stream. Now, if we run this container again, oh, one second. If we run this container again, getting lost in my Tmux windows. We can now see that we've received these events and in code, we, we've handled them. So if we take a look at this a little bit, we can see it's very similar to what the CTR tool gives us. Um, however, we can, we can get some more information about this. So we can sell the PID, we get a timestamp, we get the image ID, right? Now this is just a very simple echo example, but this starts to, to tell how we can get these hooks in. So if we go ahead and delete this, we have the exit event as well, right? So very simple example, let's build on a little bit. So say, uh, let's start with a use case. So here, um, this is nice, I get the echo event, I can see that things are created, um, and I, I, I get a log. But let's say we wanna take it a, a little bit further. So in the next example, um, I'm gonna do a couple new things. So first, I'm gonna get some more information about the process. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna receive this event, and upon the event, I'm going to inspect a little more from, from the system. So I wanna get things um, more, more about that process. So in my use case, I want to, as an ops person, I wanna know, uh, I wanna be able to track uh, how much memory my images are using upon start. Now, th the reason for this is, say uh, I have an image building service. And every time an image is built, I wanna know how much resources these are gonna take uh, when I launch these. Um, but I don't only wanna just put it out and parse the, the, the logs, I wanna send it to a remote service. So I wanna capture these events, get some information about this, and then send it off to a remote facility so that I can search and track later. So with this, where there's another handler, and this is probably, let me zoom out just a tad. So, very similar to um, what we had in the slides, what this is gonna do also using the LogRS uh, facility, only it's gonna add a hook now which uses this, the Logly service. And this is going to take um, the, catch the event, it's going to inspect the process, and then it's gonna fire this off uh, to, to the Logly service, if everything works, hopefully the Wi-Fi works. So let's take a look. Okay, so I have my, my event handler listening, and I'm gonna run this again. So we can see, once again, we have the same type uh, of event handling, only this, if you look a little bit closer, we can see that we also have the ID, but we get some more information such as resident memory, virtual memory, um, and so on and so forth. And now, in the, also in the code, we've noticed that we've done one other thing here, and that's, uh, we've, we've, we now have an if check to say if this is of type of exit, uh, or it's not an exit, then we inspect this. So we can now see how we're going a little bit further where we're switching on the actual event type. And if we look at this, uh-oh, hold on. We 
we should be able to see that we now have two events that have fired um, that are being sent up to Logly. So now we can use um, this to track over time. As we build new images, we can see what impact does this have? Do I need to change capacity planning? Do I need to have different types? Is there something different where all of a sudden I'm using 10 times as much memory from start? So we can use these events to capture this information, inspect it, and then send it off. So that's good, but let's take it yet a little bit further. So, as mentioned before, there is um, a metrics endpoint that comes built in in container D. All you need to do is, is enable it. And what this is is a Prometheus compatible uh, endpoint. It doesn't, uh, not only does it give you container D metrics such as GFPC stats um, and, and a lot of other information about the container D process, but it also gives you container level metrics and C group stats as well as out of memory events. So uh, by default, out of the box, you can have a very rich um, metrics endpoint that you can use in any of your tooling. And this can be used to trigger other events or alerts and so on and so forth. So let's take a look at that. So here we have just an instance of Prometheus running. Um, and if I go back and start a container, which we have, we have one running, now I can check and just look. And so out of the box, there are several uh, available metrics that we can use to trigger various things. So here, let's look to see how much memory we're using. So if we run this, we get a nice graph. Um, we'll reduce this a little bit. And we can see that this container is using about uh, 8.6 megs of memory. So this is great. We get an endpoint out of the box, um, or metrics endpoint out of the box that we can use to, to suck into our metric system and, and leverage uh, various integrations. But so let's try another use case. So let's say, for example, um, that uh, I, as an ops person, want to not only capture metrics information about containers, but I also want to trigger alerts. So in Prometheus, there's a system called the Alerts Manager, which will uh, allow you to receive undefined events or uh, um, rules in Prometheus, which can then be used to trigger alerts. So uh, I don't want to manually create these. If I look out of the box, I, I don't have any of these. I don't want to manually worry about creating these over and over as you know, there may be a lot of churn um, in how many containers I'm creating. So instead, I would rather use the events to automatically uh, configure these. So let's take a look at that code. So in this example, um, we're gonna use the Prometheus library. Uh, there's, this is basically the scaffolding just to get a handle for Prometheus. If we look in the actual handler, um, we can see that we're now gonna trigger get a little bit further on the event types. So here, uh, I'm gonna look at this start event, or the event type of start, and if it is a start event, I want to add a rule. And this is going to add a rule. Um, this has been refactored so you can read it. Um, but this is going to add a rule to the Prometheus config. And if there is an exit uh, status from the container, it's going to remove it because I don't want to monitor. I want to be alerted on containers um, that, have, that, have, that are already exited. So let's run this to see, see what happens. So I'm going to clear out um, my environment real quick. just so we can see the rule being added. Okay. Okay, so now if we run it again, and we look, we can see we caught the event, right? We're, we're handling it and we're gonna add a Prometheus rule. If we jump back over to Prometheus, we should see that we have an automatic rule that's been added in and in fact, uh, I'm a little uh, too greedy that it's, it's using a little too much memory to start and it's actually firing. And if we go and launch um, yet another one, we can see that these are automatically added in. So without uh, having to go in and manually configure any config files or any rules or anything like this, we can leverage the events to either add and remove um, the alerting system uh, in Prometheus, which can then be used to integrate with a, with a greater system. And I don't have to worry about touching it. So I can be uh, event driven instead of having to manually make sure that someone configures it and hopefully they don't miss one um, or something gets misconfigured. And just as um, they are added, we can check to make sure they're removed. and they're automatically removed using, using the events. 
Okay. So that's Containerd metrics. Shows how we can go a little bit further uh, with the Containerd events to automatically add metrics. So as mentioned before, there's there's another thing that um, Containerd does not provide, and that is um, networking, right? So as I mentioned, Containerd gives you all of the primitives to do any type uh, to set up really any networking you want to. You're expected to bring your own. With the CTR tool, what it does by default is set up the namespaces for you. So in this example, what I've done is when you launch it, all of the containers that I've been launching gives you just a simple loopback interface. Now that would be what would be really nice if you had the ability to create virtual ETH pairs, um, set up bridging set up any type if you, if you need to bridge, outside world set up masquerading um, and that, so on and so forth. Um, it would be really nice if there was a system that could do that for us. And in fact, there is. So there's a project called the Container Network Initiative. And what this is is a specification and a set of libraries that allows you to create plugins uh, that work and w manage network interfaces in Linux, in Linux containers. And CNI comes with a set of plugins that allows us to do just what I want it to do. I want it to create virtual Ethernet pairs. If I need different types of networks, um, I, I can create those and it, using different functionality. And CNI um, comes with a set of built-in plugins. And these plugins um, are a bridge, IPVLAN, loopback, MACVLAN, and point-to-point. -point. And these are all managed in as part of the, the CNI uh, project. The CNI also supports, um, since it is a spec, um, it supports community third-party plugins such as Calico or Weave, Contiv, and even others, there's several others that allow you to do um, really any type of, of networking, even down to lower level specific um, uh, network cards and such. So how do we, what I want to do is I want to be able to access uh, the networking from my containers. So the containers uh, in this example are great, but I, uh, like I said, there's no networking, so how do we integrate these? Well, in CNI, you start with a spec, and this spec looks uh, like this. Pretty, pretty simple, um, not too crazy. We're going to specifically, if you look at uh, two fields here, is the name and the type. And the type is um, the, the specific plugin that you're using, and the name is just the name of the network, and the rest of it is um, fields and configuration for the specific plugin. So how do we take that to work with um, container D? Well, in code, it's pretty simple, relatively simple. First, what we want to do is we want to create um, a netconf. So we want to use the libcni library to create using that config and the network name. We want to create a netconf. Then we want to create a CNI config, which is basically just telling you where these plugins reside. Right? It's where's the path that this uh, that CNI can use to, to get to these plugins. Then we want to create a runtime config. And then this is um, specifies the container ID, the network namespace, uh, as well as the Ethernet device inside of the container. And lastly, uh, we want to actually add the network and connect it. Now, pretty simple, but I don't want to do this over and over and over, and um, I, I, I also don't want to manage trying to find um, the, you know, the, the namespace as well as to make sure that the Ethernet devices inside don't clash. What if I try to add two, and now I need to know, what's ones, you know what are in there, what aren't. So I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, a project that I have called Circuit. And what Circuit does is just that. It manages uh, multiple CNI networks and allows you to connect containers um, Containerd containers to and from these networks. So if we go take a look at the uh, demo real quick. So if we look at the networks, we're going to just run this very simple network list, and we can see that right now I have one network defined, which is external, which is of type point to point. I want to create a new network so we can use, I want to create a bridge network so that I can access uh, the outside world. So if I look at the CNI config, um, it's very very similar to what we saw in the slide in that it defines a name, which is default, and the type, which is bridge. Now, I'll divert just for a second. The CNI project will not only allow you to create network plugins, but it also um, divides it to where you can also create IPAM plugins. So here I have IPAM specified, um, and I'm going to use the host local plugin, which is just going to generate me a local IP. But you can also either write your own, or you can use DHCP, and so on and so forth. So if I create this network, Created. So now I have two networks, right? Okay, great. Now I want to take this container D container and I want to attach it to this uh, CNI network. So with that, I'm going to do network 
connect, oh, first I need to list the container. First I need to run it. <laughs> okay, so I have a container. I'm gonna get the PID because I need the PID so I know how to access uh, the namespace. So I'm gonna do uh, circuit network connect. And we're gonna give it the PID as well as the network that we wanna connect it to. Before we do that, we're gonna take a look um, and actually look to see, to, to show that we only have uh, a loop back in there. So, as we show this all on the slide, all it right now has is a very simple uh, loopback. So when we run this, it's connected. Now if we look at the network, we now can see we have two network devices. One is loopback and one is ETH0, which is allocated an IP on that same range. So we've shown how we can take um, a container D container and connect it up to a CNI network. So that's great. Um, but I don't want to manage this every time. So if I want to launch these containers, um, I don't want to worry about, you know, uh, starting and connecting and making sure that they're actually still running in this. I would rather it be event driven. So we can put it all together um, and use the event system to trigger these to automatically connect. So let's get out of this. I'm going to delete this real quick so we have a clean slate. So now if we run our listener again. So once again, as we saw just everywhere before, it's listening to the event stream and now we're gonna run some containers. So if we run this again, we can see once again, it's catching the create uh, the event. It's going to then connect this container over to um, the default network. And if we look at this, we can see that it's automatically allocated using the event stream. So I don't have to touch it. It's automatically being allocated. And if I furthermore, if I run another one, note the IP, this is 36. We can see that from another container, it's automatically benchmarking across and it's connecting to the other host. So, if we put it all together, we can see how we can leverage the container D events on the event stream to take uh, a, a container D container which has no networking and leverage the CNI project where we can use any number of plugins that is supported by CNI. And then using the event stream, we can automatically wire these together. So, uh, that's it. I want to advise you to please look at the ContainerD project. Um, it is very well done. All the source code is up here. If you have any questions, I'll take questions as well, or you can come see me at the end. Um, so thank you. Questions? So I saw that you were basically creating um, uh, alert rules into Prometheus uh, on the fly with uh, events. So do you need a specific uh, configuration for Prometheus, like something hacky, or is just like can, can be done out of the box with Prometheus? Uh, sure, so yeah, great question. Uh, in my specific example, what I'm doing is uh, I've defined um, the specific metric that I'm keying in on, which happened to be the memory. Um, it's, it's not hacky per se, and so what you do is there's a, there's a specific config for the, uh, for the Prometheus rule that says alert X if condition. And so all I'm doing as code is generating those out and then calling out to the Prometheus API to reload its config. So it's not hacky, it would be nice if there was an actual rich API for Prometheus and I'm, I don't believe there is to where you can, uh, using their API add, add rules, I believe it has to be from the config, but they do provide a mechanism where you can reload the config using the API, so it's not too bad. So in, in your examples, you were uh, running your little uh, demo app sort of r right there on the, on the console, on the local host, I guess, and it was um, syncing the events from the container that you were starting with the container uh, uh, command line. 
could you could you run that app that was syncing the events in a container itself or yeah, yeah absolutely and and that would be the best part uh, i didn't have time to get it all in there i was refactoring at the end but yes you could absolutely run those you um basically you just need to to get the grpc connection back to container d but yeah you could totally run those in a container and, and mm -hmm. are these container d events sort of a subset of the events you could get uh, just from the Docker daemon itself? Or? Yeah, so these are completely separate, and I believe there's some uh, Container D folks uh, in the room, but yes, they are separate. So these are coming just from Container D, so the events that you will receive are only the events that are coming from Container D, and the Docker events uh, also use those, but then they add their own events as well. So if you do an image pull or you do you know, a service create, you get those uh, events as well. So uh, can you speculate about the volume stuff? So you showed about the networking, what happens in the, in the case of storage? Is there anything? To my knowledge, which I will defer to the Container D maintainers, but uh, the, the volumes and volume management is out of the scope of the Container D project. So that is, that is intended to be handled by a downstream, so such as Docker. So Container D will manage that portion, and then the downstream would handle volumes and setting them up and using, uh, such as specifying the mounts and so on and so forth. Um, as part of the spec when using, uh, when launching through containers. So, so in your example, you showed CNI. There is no equivalent for, for uh, storage part. Yet, uh, so there, there is a group being created uh, that's called CSI, which is a group of several members uh, from from the community that are that are working towards something like CNI for storage. Yes. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. If no more questions, uh, let's give another round of applause. Uh, applause, to Evan. Thank you.